the Atlantic and the Pyrenees. Origin and destination. Or do I mean destiny? I'm going on a journey of self-discovery. What a place. Walking stretches between the summits of the Spanish and French Pyrenees. My word. Approaching three score years and ten, I have much to reflect on. What is the secret of being happy in life, do you think, now? So I'm challenging myself on an ambitious mountain adventure. <laughs> I'll start at the Atlantic Ocean, crossing borders between Spain and France, and end at the Mediterranean Sea. Meeting the people who live here. Working on the land together, everybody's equal, and that's when you really bond. It's like falling in love again. I began to get this sense of total peace. I'll test myself physically. <laughs> this is no joke and have time to contemplate the past. Somewhere through these hills, my father walked to leave Spain as a political refugee. Open to whatever this personal quest may teach me. It has impressed upon me how free is the human spirit to choose its own way. And that is inspiring. back in Spain. Uh, not a bit of Spain I know particularly well. This is uh, the Basque country. They have their own Basque language. But nonetheless, it is Spain. And I feel very aware of that. My uh, Spanish father, my Spanish background, is really a big part of my life. And I love returning here. I feel very comfortable in Spain. My parents were Spanish and Scottish. That dual heritage is fundamental to my identity. I start my Pyrenean quest in the Spanish Basque region, whose strong identity has led to conflict, and some of its people brought my parents together. Pyrenees, I'm told, are pretty demanding mountains, and I am no mountaineer, uh, and I'm no longer in the first flush of youth either. So this is a personal challenge. And being March, it just so happens that today is the anniversary of my parents' wedding, all the way back in 1940. And you might ask, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, actually, I'll tell you as I go along. But so, just like a walk I did in Devon and Cornwall a year ago, this is um, a bit of a personal odyssey, a bit of self-discovery, as well as discovery of these gorgeous lands and the people who live in them. Oh, and the food and the drink that they enjoy. Over the next three days, I want to understand what it means to be Basque and why for many years a bloody insurrection was fought to make this distinctive region independent of Spain. Once I've left the Atlantic, I'll cover a distance of 40 miles, where I'll meet a father and son whose work preserves a symbol of Basque culture. I'll then follow a smuggler's path before visiting a traditional Basque village, where I'll find a British writer who's been welcomed into this private community. My route will then take me to the Bathtan Valley to meet a student who embraces the mythical beliefs of the area before I joined part of a pilgrimage route that I took over 20 years ago, when life had dealt me a blow, or so it seemed. Goodbye, creature comforts. I'm on my way. Traditionally, a Pyrenean adventure carries the intrepid pilgrim from coast to coast. Oh, look at that! 
Recently, we've seen miserable scenes of European civilians being bombed from the air. But the prototype for all that happened just a few miles away. There was a place called uh, Guernica, or Guernica, uh, very near Bilbao. And in 1937, it was bombed very badly. It was a sort of dress rehearsal for aerial bombardment. And it was so bad that the British government, which had been very iffy about taking refugees from the Spanish Civil War, decided that it would relent and allow as many children as could cram onto a single ship to go to England. Well, some of them ended up in Oxford, where my mother was an undergraduate. She was reading Spanish. She went to meet the Basque children. She befriended them. And then, in 1939, a story I've yet to tell you, my father left Spain as a refugee, crossed the Pyrenees, and was drawn to Oxford because he was an academic, a don. Went to Oxford, heard about the refugee children, met them, met my mother. My mother proposed to him. Here I am. It feels poignant to be starting my journey in a zone significant to my heritage. Ocean at my back, striking towards the mountains. And the way is slippery and steep. This adventure involves mental exercise as much as physical. There'll be moments of solitude which I'll use to think about my life and my parents' suffering. I'll consider their experiences of war and reflect on the latest savagery in Europe. Ah, what a slimy, slippery slope. Oh, what a bog. The Atlantic and the Pyrenees, origin and destination, or do I mean destiny? Well, as you can see, I'm just at the start of my pilgrim's progress, and yet I'm already quite tired. I think the bad weather makes it so much more exhausting. And the mountains, well, they're just smears in the mist. It looks like it's going to be a wet one. Despite the arduous and soggy start, the terrain soon levels out, and I find myself deep in the Basque country. There's an everyday object that symbolizes the culture here, and which would mightily assist a novice walker like me. Hello, Benya. Oh, good morning, Neguno, Michael. How are you? It's lovely to see you, Benya. Let's go. Thank you very much. Three generations of Benyat Alberdi's family have been hand-making traditional Basque walking sticks, or maquilas, in this workshop since 1948. The maquila, this is a very Basque thing. Yes, it is part of our culture. It is a symbol of respect. Not every Basque would have a walking stick like this. It's, it's what, for older people, maybe? Normally, yes, because you have to deserve it. For instance, uh, if someone has uh, worked in a company for a long time and he has to do very well his job, his workmates offer him a, a maquila eh, to show him uh, their respect. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to say, we appreciate you, we love you. Is it quite a long process to make a maquila? Yes, uh, it takes very long because uh, just the wood drying uh, at least 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> but the first step is in the forest. When we, we go there to make the tattoo, the tattoo here in the wood, you can see there is, there is a mark, and this mark is the cuts I did on the branch. This is the scarring. A scarring, and that's it. Just with a white medlar. If you do that to another tree, it doesn't work. Right. I don't know why, but it doesn't work. We do this in springtime. Yes. I go back in winter to right. cut the branch, put it in the oven, uh, remove the skin, yes. and, and the result is this max. Huh? Well, what patience you must have. <laughs> what does this eventually become? Voila, maquila. The beautiful thing is that we are doing a very old product exactly the same way. Eh? So everything by hand, 
Here on the bottom, we got the nickel silver part, everything engraved by hand, of course, with back symbols. We got the, the handle, uh, which is covered with leather. And here we can write whatever you, we want. This is the most emotional part. And on the top, we got the horn. Oh. Wow. It, it, it was not considered as an arm, OK? Because it's not very practical, let's say. But it, it was to show that, uh, that uh, people have to respect you, OK? You use it like that, with the loop over your hand. Exactly. <laughs> and that is a very, very beautiful product. What a wonderful result. Mm, thank you. Thank you. The workshop has some fascinating vintage maquilas in its collection. This maquila was made in, in Guernica. It's marked Guernica 1923. Ooh. It was before all of the bombs. Benyat is referring to the aerial bombardment of Guernica, which is so significant in my family history. During the Spanish Civil War, the attacks by fascist forces took the lives of hundreds of civilians and caused the mass evacuation of Basque children. I'm very interested in this because, um, in a way, my parents met because of the bombing of Guernica. 4,000 children were evacuated and went to Britain, and that's how they met. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece and very historic. At the moment, Michael, my father is working in your inscription. My inscription? Yeah, 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 yeah in your inscription. What, what do you mean? You're going to be honored uh, with a maquila, and, and my father is, is, is making this special customized inscription for you. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs> what a great honor. Qué honor. Qué privilegio. El honor es mío. No, 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 no. El honor es todo mío. The maquila, like the blackberry, la chapella, is a very traditional, um, a symbol, something that anyone would recognize as being Basque. And yet, uh, these symbols were suppressed uh, politically. And it's so marvelous to see that they have been reintroduced. And it's taken the efforts of Iñaki and Benyat to make sure that that has happened. It's great. Your maquila. My maquila. Your it's maquila, your bus maquila. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. And it is written, Ondo y Billy. Walk well. Have a good walk. Have a good walk, exactly. Muchísimas gracias. A ti. Muchísimas Thank gracias. You Thank you very much. Es un gran honor, realmente. It's a great honor to have a maquila. With such an honor bestowed upon me, not even the weather can dampen my spirits on my ambitious quest. <sighs> my breathlessness tells me that I'm already at some altitude, and I had hoped for glorious views. No such thing. I'm on the first stage of my Pyrenean adventure, a personal odyssey through the foothills of the Spanish Basque region. At almost 500 meters above sea level, this part of Spain is home to a population of three million. As I walk deeper into the Basque mountains, I'm keen to understand better this unique culture. The Basques have a reputation for being very principled, very determined, very hard-headed. You could say in English, hard nuts. In fact, there's a story about a Basque who was so hard-headed that he knocked nails into a wall with his head. And he did this again and again. But one day, the nail wouldn't go through the wall. So they rushed around the other side to see what was going on. On the other side of the wall, there was another Basque with his head against the wall, sleeping. And that's what stopped the nail. Those are the Basques. I'm close to the Spanish border with France. The unpredictable weather and challenging terrain provide an excellent habitat for the smuggler. 
In the harsh post-war years, some Basques would top up their incomes by smuggling Spanish livestock to France and French copper, wire and tobacco to Spain. Hola. Hola. Será usted Santiago, no? Sí, sí, soy Santiago, sí. Soy Michael. Muy bien, mucho gusto. Encantado. Sí. ¿Qué tal? Bien, bien. Caminamos un ratito. Sí, sí. Retired bootlegger Santiago Elizagoen is meeting me on what was once a major contraband route. Me dicen que usted ha sido contrabandista, ¿verdad? Sí, sí, sí. sí. Empecé de joven y siempre hemos hecho así. Me ha gustado, siempre. Trabajo duro, pero con ganas, trabajando. Three nights of smuggling would earn more than most workers could take home in a month. ¿Y qué ha sido del negocio ahora? El negocio entonces ayudaba al, en el caserío. Eh, siempre había poca cosa en el caserío y no había dinero. Y luego ya un poco más, medio jor, eh, jornal en casa y otro medio para mí. Entonces, mm. para hacer fiesta y, bueno, mm. para pa comer nosotros mismos. Con 18 años y así, la mitad para nosotros, otra mitad a casa. Mm. I think it wasn't all about survival. The smugglers had community support. Farmers provided hiding places, and shepherds would cover over the smugglers' tracks. They would pay the shepherds, and then the horses that they used, they would shoe them the wrong way round, so that the tracks would lead in the wrong direction. Now, that's very clever. Santiago's contrabandist career lasted for 14 years, and he was never caught. What, what is this house? Esta casita que era. Y aquí hacían fuego. Sí. Fuego para calentar y eso. Sí. Pero luego uh, un amigo mío subió a la chimenea y le puso una piedra. Y el humo cuando empezó aquí abajo abrió la puerta y salió una, un guardia civil. Today Santiago is an upright citizen. But he can't resist cocking one final snook at the police by eating at their table. To new friendships and to the Basque region. Nuevas amistades y la región vasca. Chin chin. Chin chin. <laughs> ah, sí, gracias. Uh, this is a bit of a trip down memory lane. In Spain, there are four meals a day. Breakfast, lunch, merienda and supper. So merienda is something that you have about six or seven o'clock. And when I was a kid in Spain, very often they would give you, as your merienda, that little snack before supper, bread and chocolate. Not a combination that we're very used to where I come from. Muy bien. Sí. Santiago is not a very scary smuggler. However, the mountains where he operated are distinctly spooky. And mountains are dominated by the people who live there, the ones who know the byways and uh, little trails. And whether we're talking about smugglers or hardened criminals or terrorists or resistance movements, he who has the mountain has the advantage. The hardiness and cunning of the Basques have, I suspect, been key to the survival of their culture and identity. From 1959 until as recently as 2011, there was a conflict between Spain and Basque separatists in which over 800 people lost their lives. Traces of this bitter 52-year rift remain on the walls across the Basque country as a reminder of continued resentment. During the dictatorship of General Franco, the movement to separate the Basque country from the rest of Spain became extremely violent. But after democracy was restored in 1977, that campaign continued with many bombings and assassinations and very large numbers of deaths. And although there is now a truce, uh, no more fighting, 
it's left a bitter legacy. There are members of my Spanish family who say to me, we can't understand why you visit the Basque country because those people hate our Spaniards. Now, luckily, the tourists can come here and not be bothered about any of those political considerations. And a truly determined outsider can win acceptance into the famously independent Basque community. I've come to the village of Thubieta, now home to British writer Georgina Howard, who came here 23 years ago and never left. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Hi. Buenos dias. Georgina. Michael, pleased to meet you. Very pleased to meet you, Very Georgina. Pleased to meet you. Should we take a little stroll? I'd love to. I'll show you around this beautiful village of ours. Adios. 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 I might have expected, you know, a village, mountain people, Basque people, uh, to kind of have some frontage, you know, keep, kind of keep people out. But they've, they've absolutely taken you in, have they? I brought up my daughter on my own here, so it was just the two of us. And the shepherds simply rallied round. Um, they helped me bring up my daughter. Um, we learnt Basque together. Obviously, my daughter's native, and I, I learned a little, a little more slowly. Um, but, yeah, they, they've been absolutely, absolutely amazing. I speak Castilian Spanish, a language shared by 560 million people across the world. Fewer than a million speak the Basque language, Euskera. Basque seems like a pretty forbidding language to me. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's very, <laughs> it's literally very foreign. It doesn't look like other European Not languages. Not at all. When you come to the area, you suddenly see all these letters that you don't want at the end of a game of Scrabble, X's and Z's and things like that. The pronunciation actually isn't that complex, but to read it, um, Yes, it does, it, does sound, it does sound complex. How did you master it? What was the key? I can talk locally with people and I can do enough to sort of open that door in that, in, in, in that rock and say, I'm making a step towards you, um, I'm, I'm part of you. And that's been the, made a huge difference. Very few Brits here actually learn Basque or make the step to learn it. Many people think of um, Spain as being a very macho society. Is that true of the Basque country? Not so much. It's traditionally a matriarchal a matriarchal society. Um, the women work in the fields, they do the community work with the men, they'll carry their stones, they'll drive the tractors or whatever, they'll lug stones out from walls and things like that. So, no, not particularly. The women mm. have a very, very strong role here. There's a great sense of community. For example, we pay our taxes by four or five uh, days a year of community work called Ausulan. So we, we come together in the morning and we all we start to help mend the bridges or cleaning the gutters or painting the school walls or whatever. And then sort of mid-morning, a tractor will come up with some big sandwiches and some bottles of cider and they'll crack, you know, they'll crack open the cider and you'll have a sandwich. And that's where you get to know the Basques. It's working on the land together. Everybody's equal. Uh, male and female, we work together and that's when you really bond. There's a really traditional house here that is quintessential of, of a lot of the houses in the area. Um, it's called Putrigenea. Every house here has a name. It's more important than surnames, actually. It would have had the animals on the ground floor. It still does. It, it still does. Piggy snout. Apparently, if you walk, walk along the, the floorboards upstairs, you get a different sound depending on which room you're in. Here we've got the cow. Donkey. And, and the people live upstairs. Ab absolutely, and so the heat would go up and keep them warm in the winter, and then the top floor of the attic would be full of hay, which would keep the heat in. In fact, my neighbours once said to me, Georgina, it's really hot in here. So as we turned down the thermostat, they went out and took the cows out. So <laughs> that to the thermostat, keeping the, keeping the house cool. Yeah, I've, I, I've passed by these houses before, but it's the first time I've ever been inside. For an intimate Basque experience, Georgina insists that we visit the local tavern for lunch. ¿Qué tal, amigos? Bien, bien. Soy Michael. Michael. Hola, Michael. ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Muy bien. On again. On again. On again. On again. Hola. 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 For starters, there's a Basque broth of chicken and noodles. It's highly nutritious and a perfect restorative for the weary walker. 
It's a typical thing you give children when they're when they're cold and hungry. They come home and they have their their broth. It'll do um, for me. So we're, we're obviously drinking cider. Exactly. You, you make it yourself. See, 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 see. Zubieta. So actually, the the cider has been made in in Zubieta. Everywhere in the Basque country makes cider. Mm. Um, it's the, the traditional bus drink, and in fact, they actually said that um, the sailors uh, survived scurvy because they would add about three pints of cider a day. So it's, um, it's the, played um, in their favour. The fruit kept the scurvy at bay. Exactly, exactly. For the main courses, there's braised chicken and a colossal hunk of beef. Excellent steak. Of course, taking rare and very heavily salted. To top it all off, my new friends offer me a local cheese, perfectly finessed with quince and walnuts. Everything here is honest, unfussy, and well worthy of a toast. Más animado, por favor. Que te animes. That was alright, wasn't it? It's brilliant. Welcome to the Basque Country. Yeah, it's it an amazing good. place. Yeah, it was good fun. Very bonito. Medical bulletin, arthritic hip doing very well. Uh, I was a bit exhausted by the rainy weather, but now that the sun is out and striding through the hillsides, all joints working well, not a squeak to be heard. Continuing my mountain adventure, I'm walking through the Spanish Basque region of the Pyrenees. Despite my Spanish heritage, this is not an area that I know well. It's very distinct from other parts of Spain. Traditions run deep and identity is strong. We talk of Spain as though it were one country, which of course, literally, politically, it is. But the variation between the regions is immense. I have a house in the south, which is all about whitewashed villages and guitars, bulls, flamenco, gypsies. This is something quite different, green valleys and Alpine villages with their little balconies. And one of the biggest differences is linguistic. Uh, here they speak Basque. In southern Spain, it's the main language, the Castilian language. And for the tourists to visit Spain with so much variety, that's a joy. But for the Spanish authorities, it's all a bit of a nightmare because there are these strong tendencies for the whole thing to drift and fall apart, which luckily so far it has not. Basques are renowned for their self-sufficiency. Just outside Thubieta, I'm heading for the community-owned water mill, which has been at the heart of the village's rural way of life since the 18th century. Although it's now very much in vogue to talk about traceability, I hear you're so close to the origins of everything. So here is the corn that's been stripped off the cob, and the farmers are going to use it for themselves. It's not even going to be sold, I don't think. Edorta Murrua has been miller here for over 10 years. Edorta. Ah. I'm Michael. Hello. Very good to see you. Hello. So this is um, a communal mill. A communal mill. The property of the mill is of the villagers, and they uh, cultivate the, the corn and put in the in the mill and I make the, the floor for, for them. You enjoy the work? I enjoy it very much. Why? I like uh, very much the solitude and be in the nature, the water, the, the birds. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, without any, without any human intervention. May I help you with that? May I, may I have uh, a go at that? It's, Is there a, a technique to this? It's, it's good for the... Yeah. For the, the dancing. <laughs> dancing? Ah, yeah. More, more. <laughs> 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 
Life is full of surprises. <laughs> Dancing <laughs> in the mill. But now here's a mystery. Because you like solitude and you're a man from the mountains and you work in a traditional mill and you speak perfect English. What, <laughs> how, how, how is this? Uh, mostly for the books. I, I really? like to read and I, I, I pra practice in my head. I don't speak uh, almost for uh, with anyone, but I speak in my head. And I learn uh, it, uh, Italian, French, English in my head. <laughs> Good. Catalan. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so while you're here sieving and milling, uh, you're thinking, I am thinking in five maybe. different languages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Gosh, they thought that. Amazing. I have danced my way to a husk. This is for the animals. Oh, good, yes. No waste at no all. No waste. Really enjoyed this, um, this, this trip into history, and I've enjoyed listening to the Miller's Tale. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lothra. On this walk, I hoped to meet people very different from me. And a daughter certainly fits the bill. Uh, a miller living in solitude, enjoying the woods and the mountains, couldn't really be more different. Although I did come here to enjoy solitude too. Well, you know, maybe a few hours of solitude, but a whole lifetime for me, no way. As I leave Thubieta, I make my way further into the Basque region and through the lush green foothills of the Bastan Valley. With fewer than 8,000 people living here, the landscape is unspoilt and truly beautiful. It's an area rich in folklore and a belief in mythical creatures. As I journey on to my next rendezvous, oh, I hope to have no unexpected encounters. You have to imagine that here by the riverbank could be the dwelling place of witches and water nymphs. And a moment ago, I slipped on one of these boulders and wonder whether it was an elf upending me. Best to proceed gingerly and carry a big stick. In a village just outside Elizondo, I'm going to meet Sara Torregueray a 25-year-old PhD student and architect. She was born here and is very proud of her heritage. She embraces the local mythology and despite the lure of city life, chooses to stay here. Hi, Michael. Hello. You were, I think, brought up in a very small town near here. I, I come from a big city. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, right, from right, right here in Rita. How did you find it, being brought up in such a, a small town? Were, were you a happy child? Yeah, sure, I did. Uh, it was like a really relaxed life, and I, I, the world we in, it's like a really, mm, in a natural way, we would say, because we are all uh, like a big family. We will, yeah, in that sense. And, and nowadays, in, in a village like that, are there many people of, of your age? Are there many young people? Uh, from my age, we are like just four guys. Oh my goodness. We, we, yeah. <laughs> we, we know each other since we were like a child. And um, in total, we would say that we were like 20 young people in general. So. And are you able to work in your little village or do you have uh, to go elsewhere? No, I, I really need to move because I, I'm an architect and right here we don't have like a really lot of work. Like so really where, where do you go for your work? I go to Pamplona every day. I live, I still really live here because I love this village and all these uh, kind of mountains and nature. The people of the Bastan Valley live in harmony with their natural surroundings. It's a principle that's enshrined in the local folklore. Tell me about some of the traditional beliefs that go along with your concern with nature. Uh, for example, one of the main beliefs is that the nature all times looking at you, watching at you. You need to be like really respectful because uh, in any time nature is going to bring you back what you did. 
and uh, that uh, person will be like a basa hound and it's looking at you. A what? Basa hound. It's a man, a keeper of the forest, and it's all the time looking what's happening. It's uh, like a project of all animals. So yeah. you feel you have an obligation to nature? It's a um, uh, take and a give. Yes. It's uh, that balance that I talk about. We're coming from nature, so we need to respect it, and he's going to respect us. But then if you don't respect nature, yeah. then there may be bad consequences from your the, the hound. hound. Yeah, it's going to take you, and it's going to, well, that's it. <laughs> Short story. <laughs> so you, you don't actually believe now that a basa hound may come well, and get us? I wouldn't say that, but... <laughs> you, you wouldn't? No, no. You would, I wouldn't, no. You, you, because, you, you don't dare to say that? No, because, uh, me, I mean, when I'm in the mountain, when you're lonely, you really have that feeling of someone's looking at you, uh, energy or something like that. Ooh, yeah, spooky. that's really strange. Or... <laughs> this, is, this is very, you, very you are spooky. Here you're safe, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm trying to imagine you in, maybe in your house. Your, yeah. You're probably on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're doing your work on your computer screen, but at the same time, a part of you yeah. is thinking about <laughs> a basa hound. Is that right? All this story, all this nature, it's part of, uh, part, part of my, myself. It's, uh, it's me, I'm, I, I will say in that way. And uh, I, I don't see myself moving to another city where I wouldn't have this connection, this feeling because the nature feed, feeds me and I feed me the nature too. So it's, I, I will be here. You, you don't yeah. want to live in New York City with Central Park? No, <laughs> that's not enough nature for me. <laughs> I'm surprised to learn that the Bathtan Valley's nature myths are still valued by the younger generation but respect for the environment is at their core, so perhaps they retain their relevance. Pelotto is the great game of the Basque people. It takes various forms. It can be played against a wall, or as in this case, with a line down the middle and uh, two teams facing each other, and a virtual net. And like tennis, the scoring is 15, 30, 40, and then you win a game. It has a territorial aspect as well. The blue team is advancing upon the red. But what exactly all the singing is about, I couldn't tell you. Judging by the people I've met so far, I can see that the Pyrenees foster a life of calm, peacefulness, and reflection. Leaving the town of Elizondo, I joined the pilgrimage route, the Camino de Santiago de Compostela that I walked a part of back in 1999. At that time, I sought solitude to reflect on my life. St. James was one of Christ's apostles. And in the ninth century, it was believed, improbably, that he was buried in northwest Spain at Santiago de Compostela. And from that time, there has been a continuous stream of pilgrims from all over Europe headed to his shrine. And the way is marked by his symbol, which is the scallop shell. And at this point, I join one of the roots of the Camino de Santiago. And I walked a distance along it about 20 years ago. And that was a time when it seemed that my political career was over. Indeed, that difficult moment when you think that the best of your life is behind you. I think in my own case, that wasn't true. I hadn't yet discovered that I didn't need to climb the greasy pole of political power and that life has many junctions and forks. And indeed, even now, I look forward to taking some of the paths 
to unmarked destinations. The pilgrim's path passes the village of Arith Kun, home to Thessario Sule, a third-generation stonemason who preserves the roots marker stones and who has made the pilgrimage four times. Hola, Cesario. Hola. Soy Michael. Buenas. Encantado, igualmente. What were you working on? ¿En qué trabajaba usted en este instante? Preparando una fuente para el camino de Santiago a los peregrinos para que no les falte agua. Okay, here is the scallop shell and the water will come out and thirsty pilgrims will be able to drink from this fountain along the Santiago way. How long does it normally take you from Bayonne to Santiago? ¿Cuánto tiempo le lleva normalmente de Bayonne en Francia hasta Santiago? 28 o 29 días. Ajá. ¿Y por qué lo hace? Tengo bastante fe en el Santiago y sí. me gusta. Y yo siempre procuro ir solo. ¿Solo? Solo, solo. Es un poco triste sí. ir solo, pero yo le recomendaría a la gente que lo hagan solo. Sí. Vas con tus pensamientos, vas a tu, tu paso solico, cuando sí. quieras paras, descansas y feliz. Mm. <laughs> feliz. Mm -hmm. El que haya ido una vez a, a Santiago quiere volver otra vez. Mm -hmm. He says that St. James will call me. We'll see whether he calls loudly enough. Le voy a regalar al señor Peregrino esta concha para que pueda repetir el viaje a, a Santiago. Muchísimas gracias. He's, he's giving me a Santiago shell so that I can do the camino for a second time. Muchísimas gracias. Muy amable. Gracias a vosotros. The pilgrim routes begin all over Europe and end at the Shrine of St. James in the town of Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain, 450 miles from here. When I walked on the pilgrim's way, I was alone, but never short of company. Normally there's a line of pilgrims ahead, stretching for more than a thousand years. And behind, the line reaches, I suppose, to infinity. And I'd slacken my pace sometimes and let others catch me up and make conversation. But there is an etiquette to the Camino. You must never pry. Some people are here because of bereavement, some because of breakup, some because of breakdown. The reasons why people do the walk can be very private. The Bastan route dates back to the Middle Ages and stretches from Bayonne in France to Pamplona in Spain. At almost 900 meters above sea level, the Alto de Belate is the highest section of the Camino de Pastan. And my finishing post for the first leg of my Pyrenean adventure. I've reached beautiful heights, but paid a price for this stinging wind in my face. Here ends my walk through the Basque region. Throughout my life, I've heard about the Basque country and those Basque refugee children through whom my parents met. And I've had to explain to people about the Basques. But I didn't know the Basque country all that well. And that was one of my objectives in this walk. And now I feel that I've encountered many aspects of their culture, and had a brush with their language and certainly enjoyed their hospitality. So, tick, tick, tick. Next time, oh, I'm in the French High Pyrenees. Everything is steeper, rockier, more fearsome. I'm on a physical quest. Keep your back straight and you hold it for 30 seconds. You've got to be kidding. As I push my body to the limit. It is painful up here. In adverse terrain. <laughs> and ascend to the summit. What a place. Of a spectacular snowy wilderness. One of the wonders of Europe, surely, and one of the wonders of the planet. 
And all those wonders are brand new next Tuesday at nine. Brand new on Friday at nine, digging for treasure tonight when a gang of amateur detectorists join Dan Walker for an archaeological adventure. Next this Tuesday, with exclusive witness testimony from those closest to the victims, Fred and Rose West, a British horror story, is after the break.